Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to our fall winter presentation. You have been given APC postcards. I wish to explain the meaning of uh, this little gift. When we began working on this presentation, my co-workers, Judith Tuitu and Louis Wong, we were having a working session with uh, Camille Bidot Weddington, who is part of this work as a stylist, and we decided to bring over on the table 27 years of APC images in order to get a feeling of what the essence of APC was, because 27 years is quite some time. Looking back at those images help us to define six groups of looks that we're going to show right now. I insist to credit my co-workers for a simple reason, because my idea of fashion is not a heroic idea where there's a genius working late at night uh, surrounded by worshippers eating no food. <laughs> we do sleep at night and we do eat food. I, I insist on, on that. We're more like a a line, with people in line, like in a street fight, you go in a line. You, you don't go on by yourself on a street fight. So I might be the leader of the pack, but I wouldn't be no leader if there were no pack. Voilà, c'est ça que je voulais dire. First group is called, in French, la militante. Uh, I was recently giving a long interview to an American magazine, and the guy wanted to know about my radical years, because people have you know, they, they don't understand. You could be a revolutionary and then switch to fashion eventually. So from 18 to 23 years old, um, I was a Trotskyist. I mean, I was a revolutionary. And I must say that now I realize how much it has influenced my, my look and my aesthetic. So I guess it gave me the capacity of being uh, against the flow and maybe helped me to build my own brand. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say about those militant years is that those girls were extremely attractive to me because they were passionate about revolution. Thank you. Second group is a well homage to the creation of uh, APC, and it's simply called uh, Madame Rao Denim. I decided to start APC in 87 uh, because I lost a suitcase in the Barcelona airport and I found it terribly uh, difficult to find a nice proportion of jean and a good sweater. So seriously, this is when I started my brand. My collection at the beginning were not even branded. I found it vulgar to have a brand name on clothes. So I will name it only by the season. So the first collection was called Winter 87 to tell you I evaluate a bit. <laughs> uh, but then a lot of girls will come to my shop and buy those men's clothes because it was a men's collection. And that pushed me in that androgynous direction when I started to officially do women's clothes. When I wanted to do jeans, I've been told that the best jeans were made in Hiroshima. So I went there uh, with a weaver. We put together some sort of something that became a secret formula. We just shook hands. Actually, we didn't shake hands. It was like samurai way, like this. No contract, no nothing. And he kept his secret for 27 years. I know I have to be a bit long here because the first girl has to change. So I'm <laughs> going to talk. Also, those kind of look, I really like them because there's nothing to see. You know, there's no belt, no bag, no jewelry, no nothing. Women don't need accessory. The way of wearing nothing special, that tells everything about a woman. Now we're going to go more in the today's eyes with the looking at the APC 90s where everything was about how to reinterpret uh, men's clothing. And I want hereby to say that we will never be done working on a trench coat or on a straight coat. You see over and over we try to reinterpret the essential pieces of our wardrobe. Minimalism isn't something simple to do. One question always remains, how to go to the very essence of a garment? How do you work on proportion and the fabric to make the garment just look right? This consistency of our work, I think this is our strength. And it might sometimes imply that we are not fashionable. 
But I take that. I buy that. I'm happy. People tell me I'm not trendy. Thank you. You know, thank you so much. You do the trend. I do my work. I think uh, being dressed this way, the game of seduction could happen on a more aristocratic way. In a sense that people are more showing their, their personality than their body. One last word about those sneakers. There is a huge uh, leather shortage issue in the fashion industry. Those ones are made with leather that is done at the APC tannery because we know by um, raw skin and we tan our own leather. Thank you. Merci. I would like to refer to Paul Verlaine. Paul Verlaine, not Tom Verlaine. No, nobody's laughing. It's okay. <laughs> Tom Verlaine was from television. It was a band a few years ago. Alors, mon rêve familier, mais en anglais, mais édité. Um, I often have some strange and striking dream of an unknown woman whom I love and who loves me and who, each time, is never quite the same nor completely another. I'm quoting this poem by Verlaine, because we are now living the reality of this first look and trying to bring you to my more ideal woman or the ghost of her. For me, the research of uh, femininity is never something obvious and it's a constant work. This group is simply called prêt à porter comes from couture because I have to tell you a story. When you were the age of my mother, when I was 10, that's a bit of math to do, uh, and you live in a small town of France, or in Tunis, like us, a local dressmaker will buy patterns from a major house in Paris and do the dress for the client. As a matter of fact, somebody like Alaya in Tunis would buy patterns from Dior and do tailoring for his own customer. This was legitimate copy. You buy the right to copy your clothes, and I, I really like it. Here, uh, we are really at the outskirt of fashion. It's, it's not exactly edgy, but in the contest for edginess, I believe you only win if you die being edgy. I like the, the spirit of the French ready-to-wear at its beginning when masters, even being respected, were seriously put in dangerous situation by beginners, which led the fact that Balenciaga had to give up in 68 because all the aristocratic client he was selling dresses has just disappeared. Thank you. The next one, number five, is an homage to Marguerite Duras. I don't want to sound snobbish or French pretentious, with my reference to our most incredible French writer. I recently was struck again by the genius of her. And as the years go by, I realize that I will be lost without having her books and movies around. And to me, those looks are an homage to the actresses that were in Duras movies. Because yes, I must confess, I do fancy Marguerite Duras's heroine. In this movie, Baxter, Vera Baxter, the actress carried this mix of intelligence and seduction that is basically what fashion should be about. Thank you. Unlike you might have thought during this presentation, I do not only like women who dress like men or like my mother or like a French intellectual. On the other hand, I must admit, I am not attracted at all by those perfect women who has an impeccable checklist where everything is perfect. Right shoe, right skin, right hair, right bag that nobody has yet, and right makeup. To me, the perfection of those girls can only make them look cold and disembodied. On the contrary, I like a very direct expression of femininity as it could appear in some French movie from the 50s. In this 57 movie called Le Doulos by Jean-Pierre Melville, uh, there's this actress. She wears very heavy makeup. She is silent and atmospheric. What I like about that girl is you can feel she has done the makeup not only to look nice, but because this is also a rebellious attitude. 
Going back to the idea of the girl I try to define, I believe that her major asset is herself only and not brand of clothes, but she knows how to choose her clothes to look sexy. And that's the maximum I can propose for sexiness. And thank you, this is the end for today. Bravo. Yeah.